Now we're going to look at how these different patterns of connectivity give rise to different kinds of actual computational functions. And this is, again, what we talked about at the start, how we're going to organize our understanding of the biology in terms of these three different types of uh, functions, broadly speaking. So this feed-forward hierarchical flow of information gives rise to categorization, abstraction, very much in line with the detector and the pandemonium examples that we've looked at previously. And then uh, there's uh, the feedback pathway, those bi-directional kind of reciprocal connections. We can understand the role that they're playing in terms of attractor dynamics, uh, this ability to uh, kind of get neurons to mutually excite each other, and also um, how you can use mental imagery, for example, um, is another phenomenon that emerges from these top-down connections, this ability to have an idea and generate a, an image associated with that idea. And then finally, within each of these areas, you have the, all those inhibitory interneurons, uh, and those are supporting this inhibitory competition and regulation. So those are the three topics we'll be talking about. So focusing on the feedforward flow of information, we can understand, again, what a detector is doing is taking all these different possible visual inputs and mapping them onto some kind of overall category response. So in this particular instance, we're looking at a bunch of different chairs, and chairs come in a great variety of different shapes and, and sizes and configurations. And at some high level in your brain, you could interpret all those different things as a chair. And if you did so, you would then be able to respond appropriately in terms of saying, oh, I need a place to sit. Where can I sit? There is a chair. The key idea that we emphasized before is that high level categories, abstractions, um, provide the most efficient basis for behavior. So if you discover the right categories, the right representation for the problem in some sense, then that's really 80% of the problem. And this is something you see if you've done any computer programming, really figuring out the right way to represent the information in the problem is most of solving the problem. Once you've got the right representation of the information, then the algorithms, the solution to the problem kind of flows from that. And that's the same thing in the brain. The brain is essentially through learning, trying to discover the right way to, way to represent the world in order to make the problems that we need to solve in the world simpler. So recognizing objects, if you had to deal with low level information about what a visual stimulus looks like versus a nice high level category like chair, you're going to be much more efficient dealing with the high level categories. Same with word recognition. As you're listening to this lecture, you're recognizing the words I'm saying. You're not paying attention too much, hopefully, to the ways in which my words might come out strange or uh, all these low level details and you're trying to get the high level concepts that allow you to understand what I'm saying. Um, so basically across everything that the human brain does, being able to recognize and categorize information efficiently is important. And that's what this feed forward hierarchical flow of information does. This is a famous example. Many of you have probably already seen this, but for those who haven't, it's a very compelling kind of visual illusion of sorts. Uh, once you know what's in the picture, you can't really unsee it. But before you know what's in the picture, it's really hard to tell what's there. It just looks like a bunch of black and white splotches. Um, and so this gives you a compelling kind of uh, uh, understanding of if you have those high level representations, this high level interpretation or encoding of the scene, then you just see it. There it is. But if you don't have that, then it's just like this big jumble, uh, the blooming, buzzing confusion people talk about with infants. Before we have the ability to represent the world in a simpler way um, as infants, we probably do have a very kind of confused, jumbled view of the world, much like you get when you see this image before you know what's in there. Just to, you know, allow everybody who hasn't seen it before to see what's going on, this is actually a Dalmatian. There's the head of the dog here, uh, leg, 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 tail, um, and then there's a kind of tree over here with a shadow and the ground that the dog is on, kind of with its head down, uh, kind of smelling something on the ground. So hopefully you can see that. And then once you see it, it, all the pieces start to fall into place. That actually is an example of an attractor dynamic that we'll talk about next. 
but uh, this gives you a much simpler way of encoding the scene rather than uh, what you would have to do just to think about each individual pixel and say, well, there was a blotch here and a blotch there and a blotch there. It's much more informationally compact to encode the world in terms of these high-level categories, a dog, a tree, that's it. Okay, so that's really the key idea. As we talked about before, you can get from those little blotches, little uh, on and off patches of light, all the way up to these high-level concepts like dog through this process of hierarchical category detection, hier hier hierarchical networks of neurons with these feed-forward flows of information, again, originating in layer 2, 3 of V1, going up to layer 4 of V2, then going from layer 4 to layer 2, 3 of V2, and so on, up to these higher and higher layers, and each step adding a little bit more complex detection on top of what's present in the layer below. And the, the sum of that, when you get up to these really high layers, are these high-level abstract categories that are important for driving behavior. So there's something a little bit, you know, kind of confusing and, and mysterious and magical about these categories in our brains. Where do they come from? How do we know what the right categories are? And how do you really define precisely what a category is? And people have wrestled with this for a long time, especially back going back in philosophy. If you look at Plato's cave, for example, he kind of was trying to think about where does our knowledge come from and what is, how do we know anything is, is really true. And the idea that, that we only see these kind of shadows, the truth is out there somewhere in, in some mythical uh, outer world, but we're just seeing these shadows. And so this kind of reified truth. But when you think about a chair, hmm, maybe there isn't a reified truth and maybe it's just a kind of fuzzy category uh, people say this about a lot of things that you know it when you see it but it's really hard to define right and same with the chair how do you know that like this is a chair that's a chair I mean geez there's a lot of weird chairs this one um, so uh, that makes it kind of uh, this is a debate that, that plays out in cognitive psychology um, how do we how do, what are the what are the basis of our categories how do we form these mental categories? And so there's a lot of research about this, but basically it isn't through precise rules. And instead it's through these weighted synaptic connections in our neurons, again, that build up over these many layers, the ability to detect the features that then allow us to categorize something. And more or less, you can, you know, you can see that there's certain places where you can sit flatter areas with some kind of backrest, et cetera. So there are ways of saying kind of what counts as a chair in general, but precisely defining it is much more difficult. Another thing that's interesting as a way of understanding the power of representing a problem in the right way are these conundrum problems. Maybe some of you have uh, experienced these, uh, had friends where you kind of get together and talk about uh, these different puzzles and, and they're, they're basically related to insight problems in psychology. They're ways of setting up a problem that essentially puts you in the wrong track initially and then you have to kind of overcome those initial assumptions figure out the different way of interpreting the problem and again once you rec once you represent the problem in the right way that's when you kind of get the insight and say aha i was thinking about this the wrong way so here's one for you two men are dead in a cabin in the woods what happened so this sets up all kinds of associations about cabins and woods and smoke coming out of the fireplace and stuff like that. And of course, those all end up being uh, kind of red herrings that are, that are leading you in the wrong direction. I won't give away the answer. Stereotypes are actually a, the normal mode of processing in our brain. And this is why stereotyping is so pervasive is because it's essentially what our brains do naturally. They're, they're a kind of categorization. Our brains are constantly trying to simplify the world. And this is where you get to see the challenge of, you know, what is true and what is false. You know, there are some elements of statistical regularities that are captured in some of our stereotypes. Um, and so again, lots of really interesting, challenging questions about uh, what, what role these are playing in our cognition. But if you understand how the brain works, you can really see that this basic drive for the brain to simplify and categorize and form these kind of stereotypes is fundamental. We have to understand how our brains operate and 
use that information to make sure that our cognition is in sync with our values.